Hi there, it's Richard Pidgeley here from Millpool Hill Church, Birmingham. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this message today. Today I want to talk literally about time. Last night our clocks went back by one hour and that meant that we had, for some of us, an extra hour in bed. Now on my study desk I have one of those little egg timers, it's stainless steel and it times basically three minutes before the um, before the sands run out. And um, have you noticed when you look at an egg timer, you turn it over and the sand starts pouring through. But as you get towards the end, it feels like the sand is going through even quicker. Our lifetime can go very quickly. Dr. Leslie Weatherhead has mathematically calculated a schedule which compares a lifetime of 70 years with the hours of a single day from seven in the morning to 11 at night. Therefore, if your age is 15, the time now is 10.25 a.m. If you are 20 years of age, the time is 11.34 a.m. If you're 25, the time is 12.42 p.m. If you're 30, the time is 1.51 p.m. If you're 35, the time is 3 p.m. If you're 40, the time is 8 minutes past 4. If you're 50, the time is 6.25 p.m. There's a few of you watching right now thinking, hey, that's my age and time, 6.25 p.m. If you're 55, it's now 7.34 p.m. at night. If you've reached 60, it's now 8.42 p.m. If you're 65, it's 9.51 p.m. And if you're 70, it's 11 p.m. Um, I wonder how many people are watching today and it's 11 p.m. for you. That's kind of scary in one way. But hey, if we love Jesus, then we know that heaven is our reward for a great life well spent in serving him. So there's no fear in death or a Christian. Well, it's almost 7.34 p.m. for me. My old pastor, Pastor Albert Garner, who pastored the Gloucester Assemblies of God Church for many, many years and was a a great man of God, he used to love to quote missionary C.T. Studd. And he would say, time goes so fast, soon your life will be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. As we age and we grow old, We often want to try to slow time down. People facing deadlines desperately try to slow time down. And Jesus is the Lord of time. He's not Doctor Who, a time lord like that, fictional, but he is literally the creator. He is the Lord of time. And when you know Jesus, you have an understanding that time is valuable. Time should be highly prized. 24 hours a day are a valuable gift for you and for me, for all of us. To know the value of one year, ask the student who has failed their final exam. To know the value of one month, ask the mother of a premature baby. To know the value of one week, ask the editor of a weekly newspaper. To know the value of just one day, ask the wage earner who has six hungry mouths to feed. To know the value of one hour, ask the lovers who are waiting to meet. To know the value of one minute, ask the person who just missed that plane. To know the value of one second, ask the person who survived an accident literally by one second. And to know the value of a millisecond, ask the Olympic silver medalist. Human life is actually relatively short when we think about the vast 
ongoing expanse of eternity. And we all age despite the legendary wonders of oil of Ule. Other products are available. Time can't be regained. Yesterday has gone. Time that is lost is literally lost forever, friends. Time, therefore, mustn't be wasted. There's a danger of wasting time on unprofitable things. Time should be used also for replenishing. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 10 says, Since a dull axe requires great strength, take time out to sharpen the blade. That's my excuse for going on a nice holiday. Time can be a great healer. The Bible tells us about a young guy called Joseph in the Old Testament, found in the book of Genesis. Joseph, the guy that had the coat of many colours. Joseph, who was thrown into a pit and then sold as a slave by his jealous brothers. That was a tough time for Joseph. But we read the story of Joseph and we see that time was a healer. It healed those family rifts and tensions amongst the brothers. Time must be accounted for. One day I will stand personally before the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the universe. I will stand before Jesus and I will have to give an account. Not for the mistakes and the sins I made because they've been washed away through his precious blood. But I will have to give an account for the way I spent my life and how I use my days after the point I met Jesus as my personal saviour. Time that is used properly will be rewarded. There will come a day when Jesus will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I live to listen to those words coming from the lips of my beautiful saviour. The Bible states that there is a time for everything. Famously, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, we read these, these words that have been read at funerals and at uh, passing out parades and all sorts of functions around the world. It says this, there is a time for everything, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to rebuild. A time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak up, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Well, I'm sure many sermons have been preached on that particular passage of scripture, but have you got it? There is a time. God sets appointed times and places to meet with us. In Jeremiah chapter 18, we read at the beginning of the chapter, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak with you there. God had a set time and a set place where he wanted to speak with his prophet Jeremiah. And right now, I want to say to you, whether you're watching this broadcast, I want to say to you right now that God wants you to know now is the time for you to be saved. Why? Because if you die in your sins, you will certainly perish. And that's not something that I want to happen to you. And it's certainly not something that God desires for your life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we read earlier in verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And I want to suggest to you right now, wherever you're watching, now is the time. Now is the time for you to grasp the fact that God Almighty, the creator of the universe, 
loves you with such an amazing passion. Now is the time for you to grasp the fact that God says through the Bible, I have loved you with an everlasting love. You might have many thoughts about God. But you need to understand this. God loves you. He loves you with such a passion. He really loves you. You might feel that you are unlovable. You might feel that no one cares. But that's simply not true. The Bible says that God loves you you. In fact, God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever should believe in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, now is the time for you to grasp the fact. It's a fact that God loves you. And then now is the time right now for you to gaze at the cross of Jesus Christ and believe that he died in your place. Cast your eyes back to that time 2,000 years ago, just outside of the great city of Jerusalem. Jesus was taken from the city and taken to the place of execution. And the Roman soldiers nailed him literally to a wooden cross and they hung him up to die. And Jesus could have called 12 legions or not more angels to come and to rescue him. He could have supernaturally just floated down from the cross, but he remained on the cross. He allowed those cruel nails of our sin to pierce through his bone and through his muscle and the gristle and to hold him to that rugged cross. He died for you. Gaze upon that wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died and dare to believe that he took your place. Why? Because he would rather die than live without you. Amazing love. And can it be that thou, my God, should die for me, the hymn writer said. Now is the time to grasp the fact that God loves you. Now is the time for you to gaze at the cross of Jesus Christ. And now is the time for you to get on your knees and in heartfelt repentance. Call out to God and say, God, I'm sorry for living without you. God, I, I dare to believe that Christ loved me and he died for me. God, I am sorry. I don't want to live like this any longer. I want to receive forgiveness. Now is the time to get on your knees, to make a decision that you're not going to live for yourself any longer, but you're going to start living God's way. Now is the time to get on your knees and to give your heart to Christ. Welcome him into your life. We all need a saviour, so why don't you trust him and exchange your old life for a brand new life that Christ offers you? At times I've heard people say to me, I'm just too bad. Jesus wouldn't want me. But that's not true. His grace reaches all and his precious, powerful blood covers all our sin. He is the saviour of the world and that includes you. And he's done that work already 2,000 years ago. He died in your place all those years ago. But right now, is the time. Today is the appointed time for you to give your heart to Christ, for you to be saved, for your life to be transformed. This is the appointed time for a miracle of new birth to take place in your heart. This is the time for you to come to Christ and to know him as your Lord and your Saviour. I can remember the time very well. It was nine o'clock on the 19th of December, 1984. I remember that time very well because it was the time I got on my knees in a youth custody cell. I had wasted my teenage years on drugs and pornography and the occult and alcohol abuse and crime. I'd burnt my life out. And after going through children's homes and foster homes, I, I felt unloved and I was broken. And my life was burnt out on crime and all sorts 
sorts of terrible things. But nine o'clock on the 19th of December, 1984, I got on my knees and I gazed at the cross of Jesus Christ. I dared to believe that Christ died for me. I, I got on my knees in repentance and I said, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And I called out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I asked him to enter my life, to be my Lord and my saviour. I wanted to crown him king of my life. And when I prayed a simple prayer, asking him to forgive me and to be my Lord and saviour, that moment a miracle happened. I got so much more though than just forgiveness. I got love and joy and peace and a sense of God's presence in my life and a wonderful new purpose to live for the glory of God. Hey, a miracle took place then because it was the appointed time for me and now is the appointed time for you. So why don't you confess your sin? Why don't you believe that Christ died for you? Why don't you invite Christ into your heart right now and believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ? And the Bible says, then you should be saved. And if you've made that decision today to give your life to Christ, connect with us, contact with us. We want to encourage you and we want to celebrate with you this amazing miracle that God is doing and has done in your life. Yes, it's time. Now is the time to be saved. Now is also the time to pray. Why? Because there is a God in heaven who hears and answers our prayers. Prayer will change things, I can guarantee you. Are you facing some insurmountable problem? Are you facing something that feels impossible? I want to tell you today that I have found through reading the Bible and by personal experience of over 30 years of walking with Christ, that prayer is the turning point. When the prophet Elijah prayed for his nation, when there was no water, no rain in the land, and there was a dearth and a drought and people were desperate and dying, Elijah prayed for the nation and his prayer was the turning point and God sent the clouds and rain and refreshed the land again. When Job, who went through terrible suffering in the Old Testament, lost everything and, and he was in a real difficult place. But the Bible says when Job prayed for his three friends, God did something amazing. God turned things around and gave Job twice as much as he had at the beginning. Prayer is amazing. Prayer is us simply talking to God and asking God to help us and listening to God and receiving his instructions and working with him. Prayer takes us into the tangible presence and the glory of God Almighty. Prayer will take you into the supernatural arena of God the Creator. Prayer is incredible. When I pray, friends, things happen. And when you pray, something amazing will happen if you put your trust in God. Now, the psalmist hit rock bottom and he was desperate for God. And in Psalm 130, we read, from the depths of despair, O Lord, I cry to you for help. Hey, that's a desperate, heartfelt prayer. And the psalmist was in the depths. He was right there, as deep down in the depths as you could possibly go. He was desperate, but he called out to the Lord for help, and the Lord heard him. The Bible tells us that from the depths of darkness, God heard a blind man called Bartimaeus, and Jesus gave him sight and gave him a miraculous healing. From the depths of degradation, God heard a lady who was immoral, a lady who was a prostitute, and how she wept at the feet of Jesus in repentance and heartfelt sorrow for her sin. And Jesus heard her and forgave her and gave her a wonderful new life. From the depths of depression, God heard his servant Elijah and gave him food and rest. From the depths of despair, God heard a father who was desperately worried about his son, who was somehow possessed by some evil force, an evil spirit. And Jesus cast that spirit out of a boy 
and gave the boy healed and well back to his father. From the very depths of the deep ocean, God heard Jonah. When Jonah ran away from God, you know the story probably. He was in a boat and going for a storm and eventually he got thrown over the side of the boat and God sent a great big fish, maybe a whale to swallow him. And in the, in the belly of this fish, this great fish, this whale, uh, the fish went down to the depths of the ocean and at the very foundation of the mountains, literally under the water, with all that pressure and all that terrible darkness and smell, Jonah calls out to the Lord in repentance. He realised he's made a mistake running away from what God wanted in his life. And God heard him at the very depths of the ocean with all that water pressure above him. And we sometimes think we're in pressure and we're struggling, but God will hear your prayer no matter what situation you find yourself in. And God gave Jonah a second chance. Do you need a miracle? Well, I want to say to you today, today is a day to pray. Right now, today is the time for you to pray, for you to hand that problem over to God and to believe that God will hear and answer your prayers. And God will do far more exceeding, far more exceeding abundant, beyond your wildest dreams and imagination. God can answer your prayers so much bigger and better than you can even ask for. He's a great big God and he's for you and he loves you. But you have to come to him in faith and you need to pray. Now is the day of salvation, but now also is the time to pray. We, of course, at Millpool Hill Church would love to pray for those that are facing difficulties. And you can connect with us and Lynn will tell you how you can do that later on at the end of this message. But you can connect with us. But much more important is you connecting with God. And you don't have to have great big long words. Just be yourself. Just sit in a chair Lie on your bed, kneel by your bedside, whatever works for you. But just connect with God. Lift your heart up to God Almighty. Tell him how things are and ask God to help you. And I promise you, he will help. God promises to hear and to answer prayer. Now is also the time for you to share your faith. Why? Because people more than ever before need the Lord. People need the Lord right now. We are living in dark days. We are living in troublesome days. We are living in days of great fear and worry. We are living in times when people have no hope. And yet in Jesus, we have light, we have love, we have purpose, we have hope, we have salvation. Now is the time for us to share our faith. The Bible tells us in 2 Kings chapter 7 that King Ben-Hadad of Aram came against the great city of Samaria and laid siege around it. And this went on for some time and eventually the people were beginning to starve in the city and it didn't look good. But outside the city walls, there were four lepers and they sat there. They were hungry also and they looked at one another and said, why are we sitting here? If we sit here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, there's no food, we're going to die. But if we go to the enemy camp, maybe they'll have compassion on us. Maybe they'll give us a scrap of food to eat. Or maybe they'll just quickly kill us. But sitting here is not going to do anything. So they decided to get up and go to the enemy camp. And as they walked as four lepers to the enemy camp, God caused those four leprous men to make such a sound as they marched towards the camp that the enemy thought it was a mighty army that had been employed by the city of Samaria to rescue them. And the enemy was so scared, they literally left their tents, their food, their gold, their silver, their equipment, and they scarpered. They ran for their lives as fast as possible. And when the four lepers got to the camp, they were surprised. There was food. There was wine, there was gold, there was silver, there was everything they could possibly need. It was just like salvation had come. They had gone from death to life. This was amazing. And as they were kind of scurrying around, laughing and joking and picking up food and, and drinking wine and enjoying this temporal salvation that they'd had, suddenly they said, we don't do well. We're enjoying all this blessing, but we're not telling others. 
and they put down what they had and they ran back to the city of Samaria to tell the good news that the enemy had gone and that there was salvation for the city. And I want to say that in Jesus, we have good news. In Jesus, we have hope. In Jesus, we have forgiveness. In Jesus, we have a connection with God the Father. In Jesus, we have purpose for life. In Jesus, we have peace, even in difficult times. In Jesus, we literally have everything. And if we keep that to ourselves, then we don't do well. Now is the time to go online and share your story. Now is the time to post something positive about the Bible and God's promises and the person of Jesus on your Facebook feed, your Instagram feed or Twitter or whatever you might have. Now is the time to talk to your neighbours where you can and where it's safe and possible. Now is the time to send that email, to send that text, to pick up the phone and speak to somebody that doesn't yet know the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus has given his people, the church, power through the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. We're not barristers. We, we're not all called to um, make um, fine speeches and be involved in apologetics. No, most of us aren't gifted speakers. We're just ordinary people, but we've met a wonderful saviour. And Jesus empowers us by his Holy Spirit, literally, to be able to tell our faith story with our friends and our family. Now is the time, friends, to get creative. Now is the time to reach out to others and, and to share the hope of the world, the Lord Jesus, with those that feel they're in darkness, that they feel they're sinking with all this doom and gloom that's happening with this pandemic right now. Now is the time to throw a lifeline to somebody with a message of Jesus Christ, the gospel of hope. Now is the time to open your mouth and not be silent. It's time to listen to what God is saying to us. How is he directing us? Now is the time to look out for people that could possibly be ready to hear some good news. Now is the time to lift up Jesus in our conversations. Today is the day of salvation, but how will people know unless one go to tell them, as it says in the book of Romans? And how can one go to tell them unless they've been sent? Well, God is sending us. Jesus said, I send you out just as the Father sent me. He is sending us out to share good news with our neighbours. And let me finish by saying now is the time for us to totally give ourselves, to consecrate ourselves, our very lives to God Almighty. Consecration simply means to dedicate yourself to, to sanctify yourself or to separate yourself to something. The hymn writer said, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway, a blessing for me. Oh Jesus, Lord and Saviour, I give myself to thee, for thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I'll own no other master. My heart shall be your throne. My life I give henceforth to live. O oh Christ, for you alone. Why should we give our lives? Why is it time to consecrate our lives to the Lord? Well, because God wants all there is of us. It's as simple as that. General Booth of the Salvation Army was asked what was the secret of his ministry and lifelong success as a Christian. And he said it was the day that General William Booth gave all that he had of himself to God Almighty. Paul the Apostle wrote in the book of Romans and dear brothers and sisters in Romans chapter 12, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because he had, because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This truly is the way to worship him. When we consider all that Jesus has done for us, is it too much really to give ourselves 100% back to him? Friends, I want to say to you today, now is the time for you to lay your life upon the altar. You see, God's fire doesn't fall 
upon empty altars. And if we want the fire and the glory of the Holy Spirit to fall upon our lives, to anoint us and to empower us and to bless us, then we have to die to self and live for Christ. We have to lay our lives upon the altar. Now is the time for us to live for God's eternal kingdom. And when we put the kingdom of God first, everything else will be added to us. Now is the time to let God get his hands upon us. God is the great potter and we are the clay. Let God get his hands upon you so he can mould you and fashion you into what he wants you to be. Now is the time to do these things. C.T. Studd, who I quoted earlier, said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice I can make for him can be too big. Do you really want the fire of God to fall upon the mean altar of your heart, to engulf your life with glory and power? If you want that, then you have to realise now is the time for you to lay your life upon the altar. It's about time, as I conclude, for you to make some life changing decisions maybe today maybe for you as you're watching this message now is the time for you to be saved now is the time for you to give your heart to Christ to be born again to start a brand new life of faith in Jesus now is the time for you to stop running away from God and to admit that you've gone wrong and without God in your life it hasn't worked but now is the time to be saved now is the time for you to pray to give those so-called insurmountable problems, those mountainous problems to God and to see him work a miracle in your life. Now is the time for you to pray for your friends and your family, to see God do miracles before your very eyes, changing other lives also. Now is the time for you to share your faith, to give hope and life through Jesus to others. Now is the time for you to consecrate yourself to God. When birds migrate in flocks to warm, sunny clim climates, leaving the cold shores of England, when they migrate, uh, they have this migrating instinct in them. It's so strong upon them. And if you were to catch one of those birds and put a bird that's going through the migratory season in a cage, it will beat its little wings against the cage, desperately trying to get out like a magnetic force, putting it towards those warm shores thousands of miles away. But once the migratory season finishes, if you open the door of the bird cage, the bird won't move. If you take the bird out of the cage and you kind of throw it up and, and try to get it to fly south, it, it, it won't move, it won't fly away because that invisible migratory pull, part of God's amazing invisible creation that's that day has stopped and I want to suggest to you right now that God is calling you to get saved to pray to consecrate your life to share your faith and the tug of the Holy Spirit is tugging upon you right now today is the day for you to have some changes in your life and so I would encourage you as you watch this message and as I finish don't resist the pulling. Don't resist the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Respond to God today and see him do something amazing in your life. I hope that this message has encouraged you. I hope that it's inspired you. But until next time, may God bless you and may he keep you.